O Father which art in heaven, we're so thankful for your presence here this Sabbath evening. We pray, Lord, that as we assemble together this evening, that your spirit will assemble with us. For we ask all of this in the worthy and the precious and the mighty name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. You know, it is a tremendous blessing to be with you here tonight. It's been a few years since we've been here last time, amen? Uh, if you were here maybe three or four years ago, we were here last. A lot has happened since we've been here the last time, amen? Do you want to know what's happened? Are you sure? I believe that Jesus is coming very soon. Do you believe that? I believe that Jesus has given us a very special message. We can put our screen on just now and it'll be a blessing. I believe that Jesus has given us a very special message that he wants us to understand. And all this Sabbath weekend, we're going to be dealing with it. I believe that when the sun set this evening, we move from common time to holy time. That this is not just another day. This is no ordinary day. This is a very special and significant day. One songwriter said, thousands have his plan reversed. Resting now upon the first, search the book and you shall know there's no scripture tells them so. Thousands, it says, all who speak the truth must say it was man who changed the day. In God's word, no change appears through the whole 6,000 years. I believe that we have a special day. What do you say? And brothers and sisters, this day is going to decide the eternal destiny of everyone that is in this world. Whether we get the seal of God or the mark of the beast. In fact, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. What book did I say? You're going to Revelation, the 13th chapter. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen, you're going to Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to be very open with you at the very outset of our meeting tonight. I know, I know. Before we even start studying, I know that there's more truth more present truth that needs to be studied than we have time. You understand that? It's impossible to take all of that has happened and to crunch and crush it into this night and tomorrow, all day we have. But I'm going to give you as much as, you, as we can take. And do, I want to give you as much as we can to show us what has happened, what is happening, what's about to happen, and what you and I need to be doing so that we can be ready for what's going on. I want to be ready. Do you want to be ready? And so, my brothers and sisters, the devil's plan is a very simple plan. His plan is a distract and divide plan. His plan is a divert and destroy plan. In fact, all this week, we're going to be studying into a series that is entitled, The Real Issue and the Final Generation. Do you believe that there's a real issue, yes or no? Now, right now, the devil, he is trying to get all of God's people confused on what the real issue is. In fact, I read a statement. I was praying. I said, dear God, there's so much that's going on. That we have over 19 million seven Adventists in the world church, and we're told that very few are going to make it through because we have been distracted, careless, indifferent. I said, dear God, please tell me in just one or two days, what can we understand that can wake us up? And as I was praying and pleading, God said to me, I promise you, it was almost like a person talking. He said, the real issue. Inspiration says these words. In the book, Medical Ministry, this is supposed to be a health emphasis. It says, Medical Ministry, page 93. Let's read it together. Father, bless these words as we have opened them. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, they tell me that still there are still some people in Maryland that believe in the spirit of prophecy. I, you better. You better still believe in the spirit. You, you're so close to Maryland. You better believe in the spirit of prophecy. Now, inspiration says in Medical Ministry 93, let's read it together. It says, let us do what? Put on every piece of the Christian armor. And steadfastly resist the enemy. Everything that we need to get on to be guarded, we need to put on. It says, we shall have to meet what? Now, we're going to prove this, brothers and sisters. I tell you, listen, there are more demons in hell in Maryland than any other place on this earth. It says, we shall have to meet fallen angels and the prince of the powers of darkness. Listen, while we may be sleeping, Satan is not sleeping. Inspiration says, Satan is by what? No means of sleep. He is what? Wide awake. That's amazing. How does he make you go to sleep, but he's awake? It says, 
Satan is wide awake. He is playing the game of life for the souls of the people of God. He will come to them with flattery of all kinds and the hope of leading them to swerve from their what? Allegiance. Let's read this together. He desires, this is talking about the devil. The devil desires to call the attention, what's the next three, four words? From the real issues. From the what? So that means there's some real issues and then there's some false issues. That means that there's some main issues, some important issues, some significant issues, and then there's some side issues. And inspiration says, Satan desires to call their attention from the real issues to what? Now, do you understand? Everything that is floating through the Seventh Adventist Church is floating. Every wind of doctrine is blowing. Someone said, I have truth. Someone said, I have truth. Someone says, leave the church. Someone said, it's amazing what the devil will do to destroy God's church. But my brothers and sisters, what you and I need to understand is not man's ideas, but what is the real issue? And so this week, we're going to be studying about this. This, 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 this Sabbath weekend, we're going to be studying about this real issue and the final generation. Now, I'm going to tell you, you, you it's amazing the places that we find where the real issue is. In fact, in a little book called Messages to Young People. What book? Someone said, I don't need to read that. I'm not a young person. Well, it's amazing how many who knew need to read it. You know, that name sometimes deceives us. Messages to Young People is not just for young people. It's for adults, too. You see, do you know that most young people have never been trained and they become adults still untrained as adults? And so the messages that we should have got as young people, we never got. And even as adults, we need to read again messages to young people. Now, in fact, inspiration says in the book, message, in the book, message to young people, inspiration talks about it. In fact, message to young people, page 445, let's read this first line together. It says, the young have many lessons to learn and the most what? Now, I blacked that out. Don't be afraid. I did that. Nah, it's okay. I got control of this. Now, it says the most important one is. Now, if I were to ask you what the most important lesson is, what would you tell me? Now, it's written said that the young have many lessons to learn. The most important one is. Now, that most important lesson is the real issue. You know that, don't you? Now, if I ask you, somebody said, well, well as, as a child, I think the most important issue is that that Young man, that young woman knows how to get a good job, knows mathematics, knows reading, writing, and arithmetic. I think that's the most important lesson. I wonder if that's the most important lesson. Now, inspiration says the young have many lessons. So we have a lot to learn, but what is the most important one? It says, and the most important one is, what is it? To learn, to know themselves. The most important lesson that a young person can learn, and let me be honest, the most important lesson that an adult can learn is to learn to what? Now, what do you call that? Someone says, well, I don't need to know myself. I know who I am. Now, do you know when a man doesn't know who he is, he loses his identity. Do you know that right now in the day that one of the greatest crimes that have been perpetrated upon America is identity theft? Am I right? Man has gotten to your bank account, they're, they're using up all your money, all your parents' money, all your family's money, and they're, they're taking up everything. You don't even know that someone else has stolen your identity, but my brothers and sisters, the same way that happens in the nation that has happened to our denomination, that the devil has stolen our identity. And the greatest lesson that we can learn today is to know who we are. Now, someone says, well, I know who I am. If I, in fact, if I were to ask everyone, I'll go one by one, what's your name? Or who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Most of us would tell us our names. But when John the Baptist was asked who he was, he didn't say, my name is John. That's not what he said. John identified his identity. And I'm going to tell you something, that the greatest thing that the devil can do to this people, to us, is to rob us and steal from us what our true identity really is. Now, let me explain and illustrate it this way. If a mouse, a what? Now, don't look at me strange. You're looking at me a mouse. Y'all have mice here in, in Maryland, am I right? You're looking like you don't know what a mice is. But if a, a, if a mouse were to come into this room tonight, and instead of squeaking like a mouse, he were to say, roar, you would know he's forgotten who he is. Am I right? If a cow were to come in this room, and instead of making its moo like a cow, it would say oink, oink, like a pig, you would say something is wrong. Am I right? 
If a lion were to come into this room tonight and instead of roaring like a lion was to say, moo, you would know that the lion has lost his identity. While we may smile at that, I'm going to tell you something. When you see a seven Adventist dressing like Babylon and eating like Babylon and listening to the same music as Babylon, looking like the world and all that, all it means is that that seven Adventist, we have lost our identity. And the greatest thing that we need is not condemnation, but education. The Bible says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And my brothers and sisters, God wants to today give us a knowledge of ourselves. The greatest thing that the devil can do to enslave us, to oppress us, is to rob us of a knowledge of ourselves and we can be the richest people in the world and yet live like a pauper if we have lost our identity. Do you know that to lose someone's identity is a sickness? It is a mental sickness. In fact, what do you classify as someone who has lost their identity? They don't know who they are anymore. What do you call that condition? Talk to me, somebody. Amnesia. When a man has amnesia, you heard of amnesia, am I right? When a man has amnesia, a man has forgotten who he is. He's lost his name. I know of real stories, literal real stories, where men and women who have been multi-millionaires have gotten amnesia have forgotten who they were and have died in shacks with no food in their mouths. They have died with barely scanty clothing on their backs. They have died with very little in their homes because they had lost a knowledge of themselves. They developed amnesia and you can be the richest man in the world and live like a papa. If we forget who we are, and I'm going to tell you something, the Seven Adventist Church, you know we're the richest denomination on the face of this planet and yet we're living like the poorest. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. What's the problem? We have forgotten our identity. We have developed spiritual amnesia. And I'm going to tell you something. What is need, I say it again, is not condemnation, but education. As to who we are, as to whose we are, and to understand what the real issue is. In fact, tonight in this series, we're going to be talking about what it means to have spiritual amnesia. But before we do, I think that we need to approach the Lord in prayer. I believe that if ever there was a time to know who we are, it's when? It's right now. In fact, would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Would you reverently kneel with me? And after a few moments of silent prayer, let's forget this congregation. Let's talk to Jesus. Let's say, dear God, show me what the real issue is. Show me, Lord, who I am, who we are, so that in this last generation that God can have a people that are prepared to meet him. And after a few moments of silent prayer, we'll get into the subject this evening, spiritual amnesia. But before we do, let's talk to Jesus. O oh, Father, which art in heaven, if ever there was a time that we needed you, we need you right now. Father, we can see with our prophetic eye a storm developing all around us, and Lord, if we are honest with ourselves, there is not one person in this room who is truly ready. And Satan's plan, Lord, has been a very effective plan. It has been a plan of diversion and destruction. And what he has done to us, Lord, he has diverted us from our true identity. He has diverted us from an understanding of who you are. And as a result, we have lost the knowledge of ourselves and who we are. And so, Father, as a church, we have spiritual amnesia. And the only hope in this last generation is a knowledge of our condition, a knowledge of our disease, a knowledge of who we are, a knowledge, Lord, of what we should be doing in this last hour. And so, Father, I plead that you remove every distracting spirit. I plead that you remove every sleeping, spiritualistic spirit that would try to put us to sleep in a time when we should be wide awake. 
And I pray, Lord, that you remove this feeble, fell, frickled clay and that you will speak to me and through me to us that we may understand what the real issue is in this final generation. Please, dear God, pour out your spirit tonight, we pray, and we thank you. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4, we're going to the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, and when you get there, if you can let me know by saying amen. Now, I know you brought Bibles, amen? In fact, let me just see your Bibles. Just, just lift them up. I want to make sure you got Bibles out there. You want to make sure for yourself that you see what the Word of God says. We're going to the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, and when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Now, in the book, Great Controversy. You know what that book is. You've read that book. It's a wonderful book. You like that book? Amen? Now, I read where a prophet wrote in this little book called Great Controversy in pages 593 and 594. You write that down and take notes. That on pages 593 and 594, the prophet of God says these words, and I'm going to quote it in our hearing. The prophet says, the last great delusion is soon to open up before us, that Antichrist will perform his marvelous works in our sight. Now, we're going to prove this, brothers and sisters, that right now, that 2017 is very prophetic, that something is happening right before our very eyes that the prophet says that Antichrist will perform his marvelous works in our sight. Now, the prophet continues. She says, so closely will the counterfeit resemble the true, the genuine, that it will be impossible. It will be what? The prophet says it will be impossible to, ex- to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. That by their statement, every miracle and every testimony must be tested. And this is why every place I go to, no matter what country or continent, I encourage everyone we minister to to make sure that they bring their Bibles. They bring their what? to make sure that they bring pen and paper for themselves. Why? Because we're living in a time when the devil wants to deceive those who do not study the Scriptures as our only safeguard in these last days. And I show you, brothers and sisters, that if we are not studying the Word of God, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that that nearly the entire world is going to be deceived by an almost overmastering delusion. And it's amazing, brothers and sisters, that even though the prophet is clear concerning this, that you and I live in a generation where mankind has found more trust and has placed more confidence in the testimony of television than in the testimony of Jesus. Am I right or wrong? We're living in a generation where the majority of mankind have more confidence and faith And what a pastor says, or what a professor says, or what a teacher says, or what culture and tradition says, instead of the Word of God. But my brothers and sisters, the Bible says, to the law and to the testimony. The Bible says that that, that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see, brothers and sisters, this is the Christian position. This is the biblical Protestant position. In fact, the whole cry of Protestantism was sola scriptura, give me the Bible. But it's amazing that this generation has changed. We have a generation today that that, that they're more interested in everything but the Bible says. In fact, I told you, brothers and sisters, that the majority of mankind today, that if a pastor or a professor or an evangelist or a man says it, they said it must be true. But if God says it, somehow we can't believe what God says. You better understand something. This is preparing the world for the final deception in these last days. In fact, my brothers and sisters, do you know that the Bible does not say to the law and to the pastor? Does it say that? The Bible does not say to the law and to the church creed or church manual. The Bible says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is what? No light in them. In fact, this word tells us that nearly the entire world is going to be deceived in the last days. It says that Satan 
is going to come down with all signs and power and lying wonders to deceive, if possible, the very elect. Now, my brothers and sisters, the elect are not those that are going down to bowling alleys. The elect are not those that are going down to theaters. The elect are praying and studying and fasting. And the Bible says that even they would be deceived if it were not for the Spirit of God. It's amazing, you know what somebody says? Somebody says, well, I don't need to study the Bible. The devil can't deceive me. I am so intelligent that, that, that the devil cannot deceive me. Well, he's right. The man who says that, he can't be deceived. You know why? He's been deceived already. I mean, how can a man stand up and think that he can look at the Bible and look at the history and think that he can be prepared? I mean, think of it, brothers and sisters, that a third of the angels were deceived by the devil. Am I right or wrong? A third of the angelic host that stood in the presence of God. They had perfect sinless experience and conditions, and the Bible said that even in the very presence of Jehovah, a third were deceived. I mean, you think of Adam and Eve. When God made them in the garden, they stood in sinless perfection. They saw God, perfect minds. They didn't need to write anything down. They had total recall in their brains. And the Bible says that even the devil was able to deceive them. Now, my brothers and sisters, what makes you think he can't deceive you and he can't deceive me? You see, in these last days, the Bible says that our only safety when the whole world is getting ready to wander after the beast, the Bible says that our only safety is to make sure that everything we believe is based on the Word of God, that in this final generation, our only hope is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible says in Acts 4, Beginning in verse 10, and when you get there, let me know by saying, Amen. Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, and they knew that what? Verse 10 says, but be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of what? What name? I can't hear you. What name? You must not like that name. You like that name? And one songwriter said, there is no other name like Jesus. It is the sweetest name I know. The Bible says, there is no other name of Jesus Christ, uh, excuse me, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Even by him does this man, he doesn't sit now, this man does what? Stand here before you hold. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders which has become the head of the corner. Verse 12 says, neither is there salvation where? In any other. That means that no man can bring you salvation. No entity can bring you salvation. The only one that can bring us salvation in these last days is Jesus Christ. The Bible says no other name under heaven. In fact, it goes on to say, for there is how many? We're in verse 12. Now, 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 now you, should be, you, you should not be looking around and everybody else, you should be looking at your Bible. Amen? Amen. You see, if this deception is so real, if the, the devil is trying to manifest himself, you should not come and look for entertainment. You should be going to the scriptures looking for yourself. Everyone in here that can read should be looking in their Bibles to say, dear God, am I prepared for the storm that's breaking? In fact, the Bible says, there is no other name given among men where, uh, whereby we must be saved. Our salvation is in a connection with Jesus Christ. But my brothers and sisters, Jesus is not in the outer court. Jesus is not in the holy place. Where is Jesus? Talk to me, somebody. Jesus is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Do you know that there is no other people on this planet that have an idea of where Jesus is right now? There is no other denomination that have an idea of what Jesus is doing since October 22nd, 1844. Our spiritual identity is belonging and connected to what Jesus is doing in that most holy place. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If we don't get into that most holy place, we will never be saved in these last days. Our salvation is in connection with Jesus. But where is Jesus? In the most holy place. In fact, go to Revelation. What book did I say? You're going to Revelation chapter 12. Jesus is in that most holy place. In the last generation, Jesus is trying to get us into that most holy place. In fact, you'll find that the real issue is inside that most holy place. Now, in Revelation chapter 12, the Bible tells us that Satan understands that there's only one group of people on this planet who understand and have a message from the master that can cause his kingdom to be destroyed. 
They can cause Babylon to fall. It's all right. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. It's all right. They can cause Babylon to fall. There's only one message, my brothers and sisters, that can cause Satan to be destroyed. And the devil's job is to try to distract that people and that person. And Revelation tells us that all of his enmity is directed not at everybody else, but at the remnant church of Bible prophecy. In fact, look at Revelation chapter 12. What book did I say? Look at Revelation 12, verse 17. Notice that you are the eye of the devil's attack. Everything that the devil is doing is focused on you. Look at what Revelation 12 says, beginning in verse 17. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Let's read verse 17 together. The Bible says, and the dragon, who's that? Talk to me, who's that? And the dragon, the devil was wroth with the woman. Who's that? That represents what? The church. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. You know, every time I come to remnant, I like to think of that name. You better know who you are as the remnant. This is our identity. Watch now. It says, and when to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of what? Jesus. You and I know that testimony is none other than the spirit of prophecy. This is not talking about every denomination. This is specifically referring to Seventh-day Adventists. Now, there are many Christians in every denomination. There are many Christians in every religion. In fact, the majority of true, the faithful people of God are not in the seven heaven church, but my friends, this church is God's house. This is God's church. And the devil says there's only one person that has a knowledge, a place that has a knowledge of this message, and the devil aims all of his attack at this church. And the, note, the question should be on our mind, why? Why does the devil hate us so much? You see, the only way to understand this, you've got to go into the sanctuary. The Bible says, thy way, O God, is in the what? How many places connected with that sanctuary? How many places? Three. You have an outer court. What else? A holy place. What else? Now let's say it together. You have a what? Outer court. What else? Holy place. What else? Most holy place. Now, the only way to understand why the devil is so upset at Seventh-day Adventists, we've got to go inside that sanctuary. Now, listen to me, brothers and sisters. When you go inside that sanctuary, you know that there are three places that are connected with that sanctuary. Three great places connected with the sanctuary, and it's like this. Would you check, would you check on that, would you check on that uh, 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 Elder Garrison? Okay, thank you. Now, this says, brothers and sisters, that there are three places. Here's the outer court, here's holy place, here's the most holy place, and Satan, every, Satan understands something about this sanctuary that God wants us to understand. That every time that Christ moves in this sanctuary, how many times? Every time. That every time that Christ moves in the sanctuary, that my brothers and sisters, every move in his ministration brings to view a new church. Did you hear what I said? I'm going to repeat that. Every move in Christ's ministration brings to view a new church. Now, how many places? How many? What are the three places? What? Out of court? What else? Holy place? What else? Most holy place. Now, every time Christ moves... New church is established. When was the first time that Christ began ministering for his people? When was the first time that Christ began his ministration for his people? Someone said at his baptism. Now listen, if it was only at his baptism, I appreciate that, that, that response, but if it was only at his baptism, we would be in trouble. Am I right? My brother and sister, do you know that the moment there was sin, there was a Savior? We needed his ministration from the moment sin entered this world. I mean, think of it, brothers and sisters. When sin came into this world, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. So man, when man sinned, immediately he should have what? Did Jesus tell him that, yes or no? You remember Genesis chapter 2? Just before him, when God placed man in the garden, God said that the day that you touch this uh, the, and eat this tree of knowledge, the day that you eat thereof, you shall not mightly die. You shall what? Did he say that, yes or no? And only the devil came around and said, no, you can eat it and touch it. You won't surely die. Jesus said, you shall what? Surely die. Now, my question is, why did not man die immediately when he sinned? The reason why is because, brothers and sisters, someone died in our place. We call that a substitute. That Jesus, the moment sin came into the world, he put himself in the place of man, and what should have fallen upon man fell on him. I say, praise God, I don't know what you say. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why the Bible calls him the lamb slain from the 
foundation of the world. Why? His ministration as the Lamb began the moment that sin entered the world. Revelation 13 8. That tells me then that the moment that sin entered the world, that the moment man sinned, that Christ's ministration on behalf of man began. That means that the first church was brought into existence. What is the name of that first church? That first church is called the First Testament Church. That was the Messianic Church. That was the church that later on became the Hebrew Church. Am I right or wrong? When did they first recognize and have the hope and believe that this would take place? You remember in Genesis 3.15? You remember Genesis 3.15? What did it say? And I will put what? Enmity between thee and the woman. Between thy seed and what else? Her seed. Now, the moment they heard about the seed, Jesus told them that a coming was going to take place. That was the First Testament church. The Jewish nation became a part of that church. Now, do you know that the First Testament church is before the Hebrew church? In fact, the first Hebrew, the first uh, Jew was Abraham, who was the father of the Jewish nation. But Adam, Adam wasn't a Jew. Adam was the father of mankind. He was a part of this First Testament outer court church. But my brothers and sisters, Jesus finished his ministration in the outer court. What year did Jesus finish his ministration in the outer court? What year? I'm going to ask you again. What year did Jesus finish his ministration in the outer court? Now listen to you. That, that lets me know you have spiritual amnesia. Now, 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 you, now we're not even talking about seven evidence. You can't even be a Christian if you don't know this. You see, when Jesus died on the cross... Do you remember his last three words? It is what? Finished. When Jesus died on the cross, he finished his ministration as a lamb in the outer court. And in 31 AD, Jesus went into the holy place. Am I right or wrong? Now, my brothers and sisters, that meant he started his ministration in the holy place, 31 AD. But remember, every time that Christ moves, what takes place? A new church is what? Established. So what took place in 31 AD? Jesus dies on the cross. He moves into his ministration as a priest in the holy place. What comes on the scene? A new church comes on the scene. What is the name of that church? Talk to me. The Christian church. Don't you remember? They started the Christian church. The Holy Spirit came out on Pentecost. And then those who looked upon the disciples. And one generation, they took the message to the entire world. And everyone that looked on them, they said, these men have turned the world upside down. They, they first called them Christians at Antioch. The Bible says the Christian church was established as a result of the move of Christ inside his ministration of the holy place. But my brothers and sisters, that wasn't his last move. Was there another move? Yes or no? From the holy place where? Into the what? Where? When did he move from the holy to the most holy place? Talk to me, somebody. October 22nd, 1844, in answer to Daniel's prophecy. And he said unto me, unto 2,000 and what? 300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And in response to that prophecy, Jesus, on October 22nd, 1844, moved from the holy into the most, I'm talking about spiritual amnesia, we forgot who we are. But when Jesus moved in his ministration inside the most holy place, remember, every time he moves, a new church is established. What church come on the scene in the most holy place? Talk to me, somebody. The remnant church of what? Bible prophecy. That's us. And the devil understands that the final church is on the scene. Now question, how many more places for Christ to move? Now, how many more churches for him to establish? That means that this is God's final church. Any man that tries to pull you out of this church, that man is of the devil. This is God's church, and the devil is afraid that when this church understands who we are and whose we are, then his head is going to be crushed. I'm telling you something, this is the real issue. In fact, go in your, Bible to, uh, go in your Bibles to the book of Leviticus. What book did I say? You're going to Leviticus 25. Now look at this now, the work begins in the outer court. That work is going to finish inside the most holy place. This plan takes us all the way from Genesis to the book of Revelation. And I'm going to tell you something that no other denomination knows what I'm going to read to you right now. You know that every other denomination believes that Jesus' plan of redemption ended in 31 AD. Am I right or wrong? You go to the Catholic church today and you ask them, I did that, don't worry. I, you go to the Catholic church today and you ask them, when does the plan of redemption end? You know they will tell you? It ended when? At the cross. You go to the Baptist church or the Episcopalian church or the Pentecostal church and you ask them, when does the plan of redemption end? They will tell you it ended at the 
And now it used to be a time when you came to Seventh-day Adventist, we would tell you, no, 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 no. But you know now that the majority even of Seventh-day Adventists, you ask them today when the, when the planetation comes to an end, and they will tell you, even professors and scholars, they will tell you it all ended at the... Why will we tell you that? Because we have spiritual, guess what? Amnesia. We have forgotten our identity. We have forgotten who we are. In fact, notice what the prophet says in, the, in Review and Herald, March 9, 1886. It's amazing that Review and Herald is not operating like it was back then. Am I right? And there's a reason for that. Now, notice what the prophet says. Let's read together. It says, ever since what? His fall. I can't hear. Satan has been where? At work to establish himself as ruler of this what? So you mean to tell me that ever since the war in heaven, Revelation 12, verse 7, Satan has been fighting the conflict. Someone says, well, that, that conflict ended in 31 AD. Now watch what the prophet says. It says, he saw the sacrificial offerings, which had been ordained to represent Christ as dying for the race, and he tried in every possible way to do what? So pervert them that the people would lose sight of their what? Did he do his job well, yes or no? So much so that when Jesus came on the scene, they wanted a sacrifice instead of the Savior. They wanted a physical lamb instead of the Lamb of God. It says, from the Jewish age down to the what? You mean to tell me it didn't stop at the cross? Yes or no? It says down to the present time. It says from the Jewish age down to the present time, Satan's warfare has been directed against, notice the two things. Number one, it's been directed against, number one, the what? Son of God. Who is the Son of God? Tell me his name. Who is this? Jesus. So Satan hates Jesus. But that's not all. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, Satan can't touch Jesus anymore. He was caught up, Revelation 12 says. And so he turns his attention on something else. It says Satan's warfare has been directed against the what? Son of God and he is. What's the next word? I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. This is the real issue. You've got to understand what the work of Jesus is. You see, my brothers and sisters, if you don't understand the work of Jesus, we are wasting our time. Someone says, well, I, well I'm going to make sure that no more women's ordination takes place. I'm going to tell you something. Do you know that women's ordination is a smoke screen? It has nothing to do with the real issue. Amen. And man is fighting over foolishness when the real issue has been ignored. I'm going to show you that every other problem that we experience at Seven Adventists is a result of us not understanding our true identity. The devil has robbed us. And let me tell you something. He's a perfect enslaver. And any time a slave master wants to completely oppress a people, he destroys a knowledge of themselves. He destroys their identity. He takes away their history. He takes away their language. He takes away their culture. He takes away their heritage. He takes away their roots. And in destroying their roots, he destroys them. And so the devil, in enslaving the denomination called Seven at Venice, he destroyed our heritage, destroyed our culture, destroyed our history, destroyed our identity, and now we have Seven at Venice that don't know who we are. We call ourselves Baptist and Episcopalian and Catholic. We don't know what it means to be a Seven at Venice. We have lost our identity. We have spiritual amnesia. And our necessity is not condemnation, but education. Now, notice what this is. It says that Satan's warfare has been directed against the Son of God and his work, and he still, talking about the devil, the devil still what? I'm going to tell you something. He's a fool, but he's an intelligent fool. He flatters himself that he will what? Now, my brothers and sisters, in order to obtain the victory, what must the devil do? He must stop Jesus inside the most holy place. He can't stop the work of Jesus in out of court. Jesus finished that. He can't stop the work of Jesus in the holy place. Jesus finished that. But in the most holy place, that work is not finished. In the most holy place, that work is still going on. In the most holy place, we find the real issue for this final generation. And the devil's job is to stop his work inside the most holy place. And your mind, if you are intelligent, should be saying, why is the devil intent upon stopping the work inside the most holy place? If you are seven heaven, as you would know why. If you knew your identity, you would know why. In fact, we must understand what the work is. Now, question. Where must I go to understand the work of Jesus? Where must I go to understand the work of Jesus? The Bible says, thy way, O God, is where? If I want to understand his way, if I want to understand his work, I've got to get inside that sanctuary. Does that make sense, yes or no? Now, my brothers and sisters, when you go inside the sanctuary, you begin to understand something. I'm going to tell you something. Do you know that all the confusion, we're going to show you this from the Bible in just a moment, that all the confusion that exists among seven heavens, 
all of the gender confusion. You know, right now there's a man preaching that God is going to accept homosexuality in Seventh Adventist Church. Right now today, we have seven Adventists that are believing that all of the things that are going on in the world, it's all right to bring them inside the seven Adventist church and that God is going to accept it. But no, my brothers and sisters, we must have a knowledge of who he is and who he wants us to be. Now, my brothers and sisters, you go in your Bible to Leviticus chapter 25, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Now, we've got to go into that sanctuary and understand the work of God. Now, what did God give us to understand the plan of redemption? Remember Jesus said? Remember what Jesus said? He was getting ready to die on the cross. He was giving the last signs. He talked about the signs in the sun, sign in the moon, sign in the stars, the distress of nations with perplexity. And then Jesus said that, that, that when you see all these things come to pass, then don't look down. He said, then do what? He said, when you see the signs of the last days, then look up for your redemption draws what? Now, do you know, brothers and sisters, this was Jesus directing us when we saw the signs of the last days that our true study should be what's going on in that heavenly sanctuary. Now, my brothers and sisters, there's a reason for that. That heavenly sanctuary is opening to us the most important subject in the entire universe. In fact, look what the prophet says. In the book Education, page 125, notice what the prophet's words are. Let's read this together. It says, the central theme of the... Now, when I say central, what do I mean? When I say central, what do I mean? The center, the main thing. It says, the central theme of the Bible. The theme about which, how many? Every other in the whole book clusters is the... Now listen, that means if we're going to understand anything in the Bible, if we're going to understand any message that God has given us, we've got to understand the plan of redemption. It says it's the central theme. It says, the restoration in the human soul of the image of God from the first... Imit intimation of what? When is the first time that God told us about his ministration? When is the first time that Christ showed us about his church? In Genesis what? 3.15. It says, from the first intimation of hope in the sentence pronounced in Eden to the last glorious promise of the revelation, they shall see his what? Face and his name shall be where? In their what? I want his name in my forehead. What do you say? It says, the burden of every book and every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of what? Now when it says this wondrous theme, it's talking about what? The plan of? I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters, that plan is so sweet. Do you understand that when you understand that plan, I don't care how many sins you've committed. I don't care how many mistakes we've made. That because of the blood and ministration of Jesus, that the worst sinner in this world can find salvation in Jesus Christ. I don't care if there was only a few hours left if man would open up his eyes to Jesus before the judgment. He could get ready through the blood and ministration of Christ if he but run to Jesus. I say praise God. Amen. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Do you know that's so beautiful was the character of Christ? That it drew from the lips of Micah, that ancient prophet. He said, who is a God? Like unto our God, that pardoneth iniquity, that passeth by the sins of the remnant of his heritage, he does not retain anger forever. He delights in mercy. We serve a wonderful Savior. What do you say? Amen. And so, you know, brothers and sisters, when you understand that, then you don't have any fear. You have courage to say, dear God, whatever I need to do in these last days, give me the power and the strength to move forward. God's plan is to restore in man the image of his maker. It says, the burden of how many books? Every book. And every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme, man's uplifting. That means that whether I'm reading Genesis or Exodus, Daniel or Revelation, that the center of it all is the plan of redemption. Now, if the plan of redemption is so significant, if the plan of redemption is so essential, God wanted to make sure that we would not misunderstand that plan. Are there those who misunderstand it today, yes or no? Then, my brothers and sisters, what did God give us to make plain the plan of redemption? What did God give us so that we would not misunderstand the redemption plan? What did he give us? Talk to me, somebody. He gave us the sanctuary. In fact, Great Controversy says this. In the book, Great Controversy, page 488, the prophet says, all who have received the light upon these subjects are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has committed where? To them. 
The sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work. Christ what? Remember, the devil is trying to stop this work. But it says that the sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work and behalf of men. It concerns not somebody, but what? Every soul living upon the earth. That sanctuary does what? It opens to view the what? So if I'm going to understand the plan of redemption, what has God given me to open and bring to view the plan of redemption? The sanctuary in heaven opens to view the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very what? So if I rightly understand that sanctuary, it brings me to the close of time, it will bring me to the final generation. So it says, it brings me now to the very close of time. And revealing the triumphant, what's the next word? So it will tell me the real issue. It will bring me to the final generation, and it will show me that Jesus is going to win in the contest between righteousness and... I'm going to tell you something. If you choose Jesus, you're on the winning team. What do you say? But in order to understand this, we've got to go to that sanctuary. Go to Psalms. Well, I'm going to come back to Leviticus. Go to Psalm 73. Go to Psalm 73. We noticed Psalm 77 already. Psalm 77 says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. But I want you to notice the way Psalm 73 puts it. And Psalm 73... And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. We're going to Psalm 73. We want to begin in verse 16. Psalm 73, beginning in verse 16. Let's read that together. The Bible says, beginning in verse 16, it says, When I thought to know this, it was what? Too painful for me. Verse 17. Until, until what, psalmist? Until I went where? Not outside of, but until I went where? Into. into the sanctuary of God. Give me the next two words. Then what? Stop, stop. Where is the place of understanding? Outside of the sanctuary or inside the sanctuary? So if I want to understand the end of anything, the purpose of anything, the, the results of anything, I've got to be inside the sanctuary. And do you know that right now today, the reason why we have spiritual amnesia is because we've left the sanctuary. The reason why now today we don't understand our identity is because we've left the sanctuary. The reason why now today there's confusion on women's ordination, there's confusion on music, there's confusion on diet, there's confusion on dress, there's confusion on worship, there's confusion on education, there's confusion in life, is because we left the sanctuary. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And any time you get the confusion that exists in Babylon, all Babylon means is confusion. And the reason why they're confused is because they rejected the light that would have led them into the most holy place. You see, in 1844, while all of the rest of the Adventists embraced the message, those of the Protestants that were being used by God rejected the first angel, and Babylon is fallen. The confusion that exists in the religious world is a confusion of not knowing who Jesus is, where Jesus is, what Jesus is doing, and what our part is in this last generation. And so the devil does not want us to go inside that sanctuary because if we go in there, we'll understand. We'll understand our identity, we'll understand who he is, and we'll understand what we should be doing. And so God gave us this sanctuary as the place of understanding. Now, if you were the devil, what would you do? I would attack that sanctuary. I would destroy that sanctuary. And do you know that right, right now today that the average seven Adventist has not heard a message on what the sanctuary is? The Bible says if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Because when you go inside that sanctuary, you find out the work of Jesus, and you'll find out that that work has two great places, and you'll find out what the work really is. Now, in the first great prophecy, you find the work. Where do I find the first great prophecy? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, what did the first prophecy say? What did it say that he was going to do? What was Jesus going to do? Look at Genesis. Let's, let's read it for a moment. Go, to, go there quickly. Go there quickly. We'll come there. Genesis 3. Go to Genesis 3. Notice now Genesis 3, beginning in verse 15. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. This is the most powerful prophecy of all the Bible. Genesis 3, 15 says, let's read it together. It says, and I will do what? Put enmity, hatred, hostility between thee and the woman. Between thy seed and what else? It shall, what's the next word? Bruise thy head. But what else? But thou shall do what? Bruise his heel. So the final part of this prophecy is that when the heel of that seed would be bruised, he would in the same time bruise the head of that serpent. Am I right or wrong? Now, my brothers and sisters, this is a symbol of the plan of redemption. Now, I want to ask you a question. Let's put that heel up right there. Now, watch this now. I, I love this part. Now, you watch that heel. You watching the heel? 
I want, I want to make my sister, you watch this. I, I, I believe my young friend will love this. Now watch this, watch this sister. Boom, praise God. That's, no, 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 you didn't see it. Let me back it up. Man. Boom, praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. You know, the devil's afraid. Every time I show that, the devil get afraid. Like, you see, that's what's going to happen to him in just a little while. You know, this is what the real issue is. His head is going to be crushed. If you want to kill a serpent, you've got to crush his head. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. When did the head of Jesus get crushed? And when did the head of, excuse me, when did the head of Satan get crushed? When did the head of Satan get crushed? Someone says at the cross. Go to Romans. What book did I say? You're going to Romans. Go to Romans. Romans 16. Someone says at the cross. Now listen. Now I do know, I do know that the Bible says that the Galgotha, you know, you know what the name Galgotha is called? That, it's called the place of a Now what, what is in the head? What's in the head? The skull. This was a place where a skull is going to be crushed on Calvary. Now, my brother and sister, but I want to show you something, that while the entire world, do you know that if you were to ask the Baptist or the Catholic or the Presbyterian or any other denomination about Genesis 3.15, they will tell you that all of that ended at, at, at the cross when Jesus died, that Satan was completely bruised, but only seven that Adventists should know that that's not true. You know why? Because thy way, O God, is in the what? It's in the sanctuary. In fact, go to Romans 16. Now, question. Who wrote the book of Romans? Who wrote the book of Romans? The Apostle Paul. Did he write it before the cross or after the cross? He wasn't converted until after Jesus died. Now Paul is writing to the Roman church. Now notice what the apostle says in Romans 16, beginning in verse 20. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says, and the God of peace, what's the next word? Shall bruise. Question, what tense is shall bruise? Past, present, or future? Shall bruise is future. So now if Jesus completely bruised the head of Satan at the cross, what sense would it make for Paul to write under divine inspiration that the bruising of the head is not in the past, but the bruising of the head is still in the future? It says that Satan, sh it says that, 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 that you shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. That tells me that the bruising of the head of Satan was not completely finished at the cross. So what do you mean? We're going to find out that the head of Satan began to be bru bruised at the cross, but the work was not finished. In fact, that word bruise in Romans 6, 20, 20, in the original from Sun Tribal, it means to crush what? So while Jesus started crushing it, in the original language, it means in Romans 16, 20, that Satan's head has not been completely crushed. And God is going to use something with him and his church to completely crush the head of Satan. And the devil knows this. And this is why the dragon is wroth with the woman and went to make war with the what? Remnant of her See, now I want to ask you a question. If I talk about the head being first, then the feet would be what? Last. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the last enemy is going to be placed under the feet. So if the remnant represents God's church, would it represent his head or his feet? Now my brother said, do you know that God is going to use the remnant church to crush Satan in connection with the ministration of Jesus Christ? Now watch this. Now question. When then, when then, would the head of Satan be completely crushed? Yes, in the time, yes, but I, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Is there something in the sanctuary that shows us when the head of Satan will be completely crushed? Yes or no? I'm talking about, I'm talking about spiritual Chinese. We forgot this. This, is, this message is gone. It's gone, brothers and sisters. This is our message. This is what raised us up at seven evidence. Now, question. This work is going to be finished on the day of atonement. Look at this. Watch what the prophet says. Watch what the prophet says. Great Controversy 4 and 9, it says, The intercession of what? Christ. In man's behalf, in the sanctuary where? Above. Is as essential to the plan of salvation or redemption as was his... I can't hear you. As was his what? Death upon the cross. By his what? Death he did what? began that work. What is the devil trying to stop? This work. What work started? His head started being what? Crushed. Was it finished? Yes or no? No. By his death, he began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete. Give me another name for complete. Give me another name for complete. Which he went to complete or finish where? 
So where is Jesus going to finish the work of crushing Satan's head? Where? In heaven. On what day? The day of atonement. What date was the day of atonement? The tenth day of the seventh month. It wasn't any day. The day of atonement was on a special day. Leviticus tells us that the day of atonement was on the tenth day of the seventh month. This is who we are. Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to me now. It's going to be finished in heaven. Now, where in the sanctuary service would I see this typified that Satan's head would be crushed? Does the Bible show us this in Leviticus, yes or no? Does the Bible show this in type, yes or no? Where would I go? Go to Leviticus. Let's go there. Leviticus 16. I'm talking about who we are. I'm trying to give us some remembrance of a knowledge of ourselves. Now, do you know that everything that we do as seven Adventists comes from an understanding of who Jesus is, what Jesus is doing, and then we understand our identity. Look at Leviticus 16. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Leviticus 16, beginning in verse 20. Leviticus 16. Now, in fact, let's pick up in verse 29. Look at Leviticus 16 and verse 29. The Bible says, let's read it together. Leviticus 16, verse 29. It says, and this shall be a statue forever unto you. That in the what month? What month? Now remember, God finishes everything in what? Now notice the David told me came on the seventh month. This is the month of finishing. It says, on the seventh month, what day? What day? On the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls. Now notice what that day is called. Jump down to verse 30. Verse 30 says, for on that what? What was the day called? The day of atonement. On that day, shall the priest make an atonement for you and you shall be what? To cleanse you that you may be clean from how much of your sins? From all your sins before the Lord. Now on that 10 day of seven month, this was the day of atonement. This is the cleansing of the sanctuary. This is what took place when Jesus moved into the most holy place. Now what takes place at the end of the day of atonement? Go to Leviticus 16. Let's go to the end and type. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, you see the symbol of what happens at the end of this day. Verse 20 says, And when he hath made an... And this is not the beginning. This is, the, this is not the beginning of the Day of Atonement. This is the end of the Day of Atonement. The Bible says, And when he hath made an end of reconciling the what? That is the most holy. And the tabernacle of the congregation, that is the holy place, and the altar, he shall bring the... Now, who is the live goat represent? Talk to me. Give me another symbol for Satan. Give me a symbol. Scapegoat, give me another symbol. Serpent. All of these represent Satan. Now, notice now Satan in the type is being brought forth at the end of the day of atonement. Not the beginning, at the end. Then notice what takes place in verse 21. Verse 21 says, and Aaron, who is Aaron represent? Who is that? This is the high priest, represents Jesus. And Aaron shall lay how many of his hands? Now, I wish we had time to tell you why both, but we don't have time tonight. It says, lay both his hands upon the tail of the live goat. Upon the feet of the live goat. I'm making sure you're reading your Bible. Amen? I'm making sure you have the right trans. Now, listen, listen to me. Why did the priest put his hand on the head of the scapegoat? He was in shadow. He was in tight showing us that it was on this day that he would finish the work of the crushing of the head of Satan on the day of... Now question, what was he going to use to crush his head? Was the priest's hand that strong? Did the priest take his hand and crush the head of uh, the scapegoat? What did he put on that scapegoat to crush the scapegoat's head? Sin. I'm, I'm thinking about it. All you got to do is understand this. Did something crush out the life of the lamb? Yes or no? When Jesus died on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, was it the nails that went through his hands? Was it the spear that went through his side? What crushed the life of the lamb of God? Sin. The wages of sin is? So then what is it that's going to crush the head of what? Satan. What's going to crush his head? Now question, whose sin? Not, your, not, 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 not some sin. How much sin is going to crush his head? All sin. In fact, look at Leviticus 16. Let's continue. Verse 20 says, it goes on in verse 21. It says, And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him, transfer to him, how much? 
all the iniquities of the children of what? Israel. And all their transgressions and all their what? Now three times it said this. All their iniquities, all their transgressions, all their sins. Putting them where? Putting them where? Upon the head of the what? Now I want to ask you a question. Did the priest sin? Yes or no? No. We're talking about, the, we're talking about who the priest represents. The priest represents Jesus. Did Jesus sin? So then where would Jesus get those sins from? He got them from the sanctuary, right? The cleansing of the sanctuary. Well, the sanctuary is it's bricks, it's stones, it's material. They don't sin. Where did the sin, how did the sin get to the sanctuary? Who sinned? You sin. I sin. Am I right? Now, how much sin is Jesus going to take from his people? How much? All. all sin. Then if he takes all their sins, what or how much sin will his people be left with? No sin? Because the Bible says he's taking all their sins. Is that right? If they're left with no sin, they will be less of sin. Is that right? Then what would they be? Sinless. So at the end of the Day of Atonement, God's people must be a what? Sinless generation. You know this is who we are. Now there are today those that new theology that's coming to the church that tells us we'll be sinning until Jesus comes. But this is not what you find on the Day of Atonement. This is not what you find inside the sanctuary. Our problem is we have spiritual amnesia. We have forgotten who we are. This message has come to us in the Day of Atonement. Jesus wants to crush the head of Satan by transferring sin from the sinner and putting it on the head of the what? Scapegoat. This will effectually crush his head. Do you know that this is the work of Jesus inside the sanctuary? In fact, go to Leviticus 25. Go to Leviticus 25, and we'll come right back to Leviticus 16. Do you know that Jesus had two great works? Inside this plan of redemption, when you study it, you'll find that Jesus had two great works inside this day of atonement. Two great works. And this was represented by the two symbols that we find inside the sanctuary. The work of the lamb and the work of the priest. Now, someone says, I thought you said three places. Yes, outer court, holy place, most holy place. But let me tell you something. Only two great works. How many great works? This is symbolized by the work of a lamb and by the work of a... Now somebody says, how in the world could we have three places and two works? Well, listen, let me do it this way. In the outer court, the outer court was the work of the lamb. The holy place is the work of the... And the work, and the work in the most holy place is the work of the... So while there are three places, two great works represented by the symbols of the lamb and of the priest. Now question, who was the lamb? Jesus, praise God. Who is the priest? Jesus. So all of this is the ministration of Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, somebody says, well, don't talk about the sanctuary. Talk about Jesus. That, that's a fool. Because think about it, brothers and sisters. Who is the lamb? Who is the priest? So when you talk about the sanctuary, who are you talking about? Jesus. This is the work of Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. The devil is tricky. The devil will make a man think that what he needs in the winter time is an air condition. Now, if you think you need air conditioning in D.C. or Maryland in the winter time, you a fool. <laughs> You've been tricked. You've been deceived. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is how the devil tries to trick us. Why? He does not want us to understand our identity. Because once we understand who Jesus is, once we understand what he's doing, then we will begin to understand who we are and who, what we should be doing. Now, watch, brothers and sisters. The first work of the Lamb... The first work of Jesus as a lamb was to make sure that man was bought. That man was what? Bought. Is that in the Bible, yes or no? Go to the book of uh, Leviticus 25, look at verse 51. Leviticus chapter 25, look at verse 51. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. In verse 51, what does the Bible say? The Bible says, if there be yet many years behind, according unto them, he shall give again the price of his what redemption out of the money that he was so what was the first part of the redemption plan that man was to be what does the bible say so yes or no it says out of the price he was to be born in other words when man sinned you know we should have died how come man doesn't have to die because someone paid the price what's his name jesus when did jesus pay the price when did he accomplish the work as a lamb? Talk to me, somebody. 
when, G, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And when Jesus died on the cross as a Lamb of God, he said, It is not the plan of redemption, but his work as a Lamb. You see, when his work as a Lamb was done, his work as a priest had just begun. I like that. You like that? <laughs> when his work as a Lamb was done, his work as a priest had just be. See, Jesus as lamb bought us, but that's not the end of redemption. That's just the beginning. But that's just as far as most religions go. But you and I, in order to understand our identity, have to go inside that sanctuary. Now question, what is the work of the priest? Now, there's a second and final part to redemption. And it's in this same chapter. You see, the whole Bible, the whole Bible is to unfold the plan of redemption. Now look at verse 55. The last verse of Leviticus 25, look at verse 55, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. The first part is man must be bought. Now, I'm not going to tell you the last one. I helped you on the first one. Now, the last one is in the answer. The answer is in the text. I want you to read it for yourself. Verse 55, let's read it together. The Bible says, for unto me, the children of Israel are what? Servants. It says, they are my servants whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your what? My question is, what is the second part of the, uh, of the plan of redemption? What is the second great work of redemption? It's right there in the text. I heard somebody say, man must not only be bought, but he must be what? Now, is there a difference between being bought and being brought? Yes or no? You know, there's something can be bought, but not brought. God begins his work as being bought. But he finishes his work by man being brought. Where does God want to bring man? God wants to bring him into the most holy place. Now, when man is brought into the most holy place, something happens in man's Christian experience. Something happens that has never happened before in his life. Something changes. Where does God want to bring man when he gets him inside the most holy place? Go to Hebrews 6. What book did I say? Now, this is the work of the saints. The book of Hebrews tells us about the sanctuary, its services, its purposes, and its objective. Now, in Hebrews 6, we find the work of the sanctuary. Go to Hebrews 6, Hebrews chapter 6. Now, I'm going to read in the spirit of prophecy. In fact, let's read this together. In the book of education, we'll come to Hebrews 6 in just a moment. In the book of education, page 15, notice what the prophet says. Let's read this together. Education, page 15, all together. What's the first line say? To do what? Restore. To restore in man the image of his maker. To bring him what? Now, wait a minute now. And one word, how would you say bring him back? How would you say bring him back in one word? Bro. So the work of Jesus is that man must not only be bought, but he must be what? The Bible says to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created to promote the development of body, mind, and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be, let's read this together. Say it together with me. It says to be the what? Work of redemption. So what was the last part of the work of redemption? To bring him back to the what? Perfection. So that means, my brothers and sisters, that the work of the priest is not only that man should be bought, but that he should be what? Brought back to perfection. Question, does the Bible say the same thing, yes or no? Everything the prophet says, the Bible says. Do you believe that? Well, then you're almost a seventh Adventist. Everything the prophet says, the Bible says, and everything the Bible says, the prophet says. In fact, go to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, let's read that in the Bible, what we just read in the spirit of prophecy. Hebrews 6, beginning in verse 1. Let's read that together. The Bible says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of what? Not of the devil, but the doctrine of Christ. Let us, what's the next two words? Now, this is where God wants to bring us. This is where God wants to bring us. Let us go on unto what? Perfection. Does the Bible say so, yes or no? Yes. Did you see it for yourself? God in the sanctuary through Jesus wants to bring us back to perfection. Now somebody says, well, don't you know what man's teaching? I know what man's saying. You know right now today that there's a theology today that says that we will be sinning until Jesus comes and that man cannot be brought back to perfection. I remember I was in one place teaching this from the Bible. One student who was coming out to the meetings went back to, to one, of the, one of our institutions, and when he went back, one of the professors said, no, there, it's impossible for man to be brought back to perfection. In fact, they said, in fact, we don't even know what perfection that the Bible is talking about. You know, there are many types of perfection. 
you better watch the scholar when he's unconverted. Man came back and said, he said, well, 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 tell me what perfection is Jesus talking about? Is it Greek perfection, Hebrew perfection, telos perfection, telos perfection, total perfection? What perfection? And, I, and when the student came back confused, I said, let me tell you something. It's more simple than that. What Jesus is talking about is biblical perfection. Now, biblical perfection, you don't need to have a degree to have, understand biblical perfection. You see, the Bible was written not just for the scholar, it was written for the common man too. The Bible was written for you and for me, praise God. Now, my brothers and sisters, when you go to Bible perfection, it's simple. Let me, let me show you how simple it is. You want it simple, yes or no? Let's make it simple as we can. When God made man, God made man perfect. Am I right? How do we know? The Bible says that man was made in the image of God. God. Is God perfect? Amen. So then when God made man in his image, man was what? Perfect. Now, man was perfect till iniquity was found in him. What was the only thing that marred the perfection of man? What was the thing that marred man's perfection? One thing, what was it? So my brothers and sisters, if the coming in of sin made man imperfect, then what is the thing that will bring him back to perfection? The removal of sin. This is biblical perfection. And my brothers and sisters, this is what we find in the sanctuary that Jesus takes sin from the sinner. The Bible says, behold the Lamb of God, which does what? Amen. Takes away the what? Sin of the world. And let me tell you something. When Jesus takes sin off of the records, when Jesus takes sin out of the heart, when Jesus takes sin out of the life, he has brought us back to perfection. Amen. Can Jesus take sin from the records, yes or no? If he can take it from the records, why can he take it from your heart and my heart? Can he take it from the heart? Can he take it from the life? Then if he takes it from the heart, the life, the record, he's brought us back to perfection and we can see Jesus as he is. Do you know that this is the work of Jesus in the most holy place? This is the real issue. In fact, notice what the prophet says concerning this. It says, the very image of God is to be reproduced where? The honor of what? God. The honor of what? Christ is involved in the what? Perfection of the character of what? His people. Now we're going to find out why this must take place. Interesting says there's no excuse for sinning. Now I love this one. Let's read this together. This is Signs of the Times, July 23rd, 1902. One of the most powerful points, quotations on this point. Let's read it together. It says how many? Everyone who believes, not on themselves, but on what? On Christ. Everyone who relies on the keeping power of what? A risen Savior. That has suffered the penalty pronounced where? Upon the transfers. He took our place. It says, everyone who resists temptation and in the midst of evil copies the what? Pattern given him where? In the what? Christ's life will through faith, not in themselves, but through faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. That's the Lamb. They will become a what? Partaker of what? The divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through what? Now, I love this part. Let's, let's read this last part together. How many? Everyone who by faith obeys what? God's commandments. It says, will reach the condition of what? Sinlessness in which Adam lived when? Before his transgression. That is redemption. That is the everlasting gospel. That is the message of the sanctuary. That is the message that God has given us. That is present truth. That is what the devil's afraid of because when seven dead Adventists understand their identity and wake up, his head will be crushed. He's afraid of this. And so my brothers and sisters, when does this happen? On the end of the day of what? Now, but if Jesus takes away our sins, it would leave us in a sinless condition by the end of the day of atonement. Are you with me? Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the work of God. Now, watch. Inspiration tells us that Satan is trying to stop this work because he does not. What would happen if God could not bring us back to what? Now, you know, the only way to understand this, thy will, God, is in the what? What would happen? Now, what does, what does Jesus use to crush Satan's head? Not his hand. I know what he uses. What does Jesus use to crush the head of Satan? I showed you already. What does he use? Talk to me, somebody. Sin. He uses sin. So if we do not give up our sins, what will Jesus have to crush the devil's head? 
Now, do you know, my brothers and sisters, the inspiration tells us that this has to happen on time. This crushing on the head. Watch now. That head must be crushed. We found out when. We found out what. We found out that that sin is what crushes the head. And when that sin is transferred upon the head, it crushes Satan's head. And so the devil's plan is to keep you and I in sin so that Jesus, at the end of the day of atonement, will have nothing to crush the head of Satan with. But do you know the Bible says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Question. Is there a specific time that Jesus will come out of that sanctuary? Yes or no? This reason tells us now. Look what it says. In Leviticus 16, the Bible says that somebody is going to bring that scapegoat. This reason says that somebody is going to bring that scapegoat. Question, who is going to bring the scapegoat according to Leviticus 26? In Leviticus 16, verse 21, read what the Bible says in Leviticus 16, 21. It says that he's going to be sent by the hand of a what? Fit. Man. Now, when I ask sometimes, I say, what does that word fit man mean? And most people, you know what they say immediately? Strong man. But that's not what the Bible says. Now, that fit man comes from the Hebrew word itty. That Hebrew word itty, it means what? Timely man. So the fit man is a man who comes on now remember, to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose in heaven. That means that that fit man, when he brings Satan, he's going to bring him at a specific what? Now my question is, does inspiration tell us what this time is? Yes or no? Watch what the prophet, yes, time Watch what the prophet says. It says, great controversy 656, a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord have a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the what? For how long? 6,000 years, the great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God and His heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. Now all have made their what? The Bible says that all have made their decisions when? At the end of what? At the end of what? 6,000 years. It says the wicked have fully united with what? When? At the end of what? 6,000 years. It says the, 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 the time has what? When? At the end of what? So at the end of 6,000 years of human history, the time comes in the sanctuary for something to take place. And in the sanctuary, everything happens on, Jesus died on, he resurrected on, he went to the holy place on, he moved to the most holy place on, he's going to come out of the most holy place on. This is that great clock of time. Everything God does is on time to everything. There's a season and a time to, to, to every purpose under heaven. And my question is, do you know the time? Because if you don't know the time, that just simply means you have spiritual amnesia. How can we call ourselves seven Adventists and not know the time? You see, we have forgotten who we are. Our name has slipped us. We have lost the knowledge of ourselves. It was an understanding of this that brought us into existence. At the end of 6,000 years, the time has come in the sanctuary. The time for what? At the coming of Christ, the earth is empty of his inhabitants. The whole earth appears like a desolate what? Now. At the end of 6,000 years, the event takes place foreshadowed when? In the last solemn service of the what? Day of Atonement. It quotes what we just read in Leviticus 16, 21, that the fit man's going to come on time. It says that, that, that when the ministration in the Holy of Holies had been completed and the sins of Israel had been removed or cleansed from the sanctuary by virtue of the blood of the sin offering, then the scapegoat was presented alive before the Lord in like manner when the work of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary has been completed. Then in the presence of God and heavenly angels and the host of the redeemed, the sins of God's people will be placed upon what? And he will be declared guilty of all the evil which he has caused them to commit. And as the scapegoat was sent away into a land not inhabited, so Satan will be banished to this desolate earth and uninhabited and dreary what? The revelation foretells, the revelator foretells the banishment of Satan and the condition of chaos and desolation to which the earth is to be reduced and declares that this condition will exist for how long? Now if you take 6,000 plus 1,000 equals what? God finishes everything in seconds. Now, I wish we had time. We could go through the Bible, and I could show you text of the text of the text that shows us the same thing, but time we're not allowed us to go through the night. And inspiration says, these types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the what? It has to happen on, now watch what the prophet says, Great Controversy 399. In like manner, the types which relate to the what? 
Now I want to ask you a question. On the Day of Atonement, was there a type of the second advent? Yes or no? What was the type of the second advent on the Day of Atonement in the shadow? Now think about this now. The sanctuary is not on earth, but the sanctuary is where? Where's the sanctuary? The outer court. Where is the antitypical outer court? Now the only way to know that is in the outer court, that's where the lamb died, right? Did Jesus die in heaven or on earth? So then the earth is the antitypical outer court. Is that right? All right. So at the end of the Day of Atonement, the high priest leaves the most holy place. Am I right? And according to Leviticus 20, 16, 20, 21, he leaves the whole, most holy place, comes back to the court, and then takes the sin and puts it on the head of the scapegoat. Am I right or wrong? Now, if the sanctuary truly is in heaven, and the outer court truly is on earth, when Jesus leaves the most holy place in heaven and comes back to the outer court, that is a type of what event? What event? Of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So when the scapegoat, when the sin is placed on the head of the scapegoat, that's the type of the event of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Now the prophet says, in like manner, the types which relate to the what? Second advent must be fulfilled when? At the time pointed out where? My brother and sister, do you know that time says that God is going to finish this thing and leave the most holy place at the end of 6,000 years? And the question is, before we close, where are we today? Is that a good question? Look at this now, because I'm going to tell you something. Do you know that it's not accident that Donald Trump is the president? You think that that just happened accidentally. You think because you, now you voted for him, you're in trouble if you voted for him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, now tomorrow we're going to show you, brothers and sisters, do you understand that Donald Trump is in place on time? I, 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 I'm trying not to get ahead of myself. I'm trying to take my time. So I, I, I wish I could tell you all tonight, brothers and sisters. Do you know that this morning while you were sleeping, a bomb dropped on Syria? Do you know what that means? I'm going to tell you something, brother. Says, you, you, see, see, it's one thing to know what that means on earth. There's another thing to know what that means in heaven. You see, something is getting ready to happen in the most holy place. And the reason why you don't know is because you and I have spiritual amnesia. We don't know who we are. And as a result, we don't know what it means today. Now watch. Do you know that the history of redemption is going to be finished in 7,000 years? The Bible goes through this. I can't go through this. Now, we, materials we have, they go through all this in detail. Every 2,000 years, something happens on the earth. You know that, don't you? And, the, and time is broken up this way. Every 2,000 years. First 2,000 years, a flood came. Am I right? And the world came to an end the first time. 2,000 years. Second 2,000 year period. What happens at the second 2,000 year period? Jesus comes to the world the first time. So about 4,000 years human history passed. Jesus comes to the earth the first time. Is that right or wrong? Every 2,000 years, something happens. Well, what about in the last 2,000 years? What's going to take place? In the last 2,000 years, this, this, you take these two and put it together, you'll get the third. Jesus will come, not the first time, but the what? Second time, and will bring the world to an end the second time, at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, all this is going to happen that same way. Now, the question is, in 2017, where are we today? Now, the earth is over 6,000 years. You know that notion. Earth is over 6,000 years. So someone says, well, how come it has to happen on time? The Bible doesn't say 6,000 years of the earth. It says 6,000 years of sin. And sin did not start the moment that the earth came into existence. When God made Adam and Eve, they didn't sin the first day. Am I right? A period of years passed by. Now, how much time? We don't know. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you this. God allows us to understand not the day and hour of his coming, but the generation of his coming. You know that, don't you? Jesus said, when you see all these things, notice coming is near, even at the door. It said, this generation shall not pass until all these things be for so that's the, not the first generation, that is the what? I'm going to tell you something, there's an issue, there's a connection between the real issue and the final generation. Now, inspiration says, God has given us a chart, pointing out every way mark on the heavenward journey, and we ought not to guess at what? How are we not going to guess? Thy way, O God, is in the? Now, inspiration says, the story of Bethlehem is an exhaustless thing. Now, what happened in Bethlehem? Jesus was born or he died? So it's talking about the birth of Christ. Now watch this, please. Don't miss this. It says, we marvel at the Savior's sacrifice in exchanging the throne of heaven for the manger and the companionship of adoring angels for the beasts of the stall. 
Human pride and self-sufficiency stand rebuked in his presence, yet this was but the beginning of his wonderful condescension. It would have been an almost what? Infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his what? Now if God had took man's nature before the fall, it would have been almost an infinite humiliation, but that's not what God did. It says, but Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by what? So when Jesus came on the scene at his birth, how much time, about how much time had passed, about what? Now you better watch this. Now do you know, brothers and sisters, that Jesus gave us a sign? Because see, he knew that we would not be able to count the day and hour to the 6,000 years and see the second coming of Christ. What we need to understand and know the time is not the date, but the event. Now God allowed an event to take place on earth at the first coming of Christ a few short months before the 4,000 year period was reached and the 4,000 generation was reached. Does anybody know what took place on earth to let them know this is going to take place? Go to Luke. What book did I say? Go to Luke chapter 2. Go to Luke chapter 2. Go to Luke chapter 2. I want you to see this from the Bible. Go to Luke chapter 2. Now remember, Bible says that nothing happens by accident. Luke chapter 2, beginning, now notice now I'm beginning in Luke 2, beginning in verse 3. Luke 2, beginning in verse 3. Now, in Luke 2, I know you know the story. In Luke 2, Jesus is getting ready to be born, and he wasn't born in a palace. He was born where? In a manger. Now watch verse 3. Bible says, and all, verse 3 says, and all went to be taxed. Everyone to his own city. Verse 4 says, and Joseph also went up from where? Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called what? Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of what? I want to ask you a question. Before Mary and Joseph left Galilee, they were in what city? The city of what? Nazareth. Now, question. Anybody ever been pregnant in this room before? Anybody ever had a, been pregnant in this room before? Let me, let me see some hands of women who've been pregnant. Now, now, you men, don't raise your hand. Now, those women who've been pregnant, if you're pregnant, are you ready to go on a long trip if you're pregnant? Now, you want to stay right where you are, am I right? So naturally, naturally, where should Mary have wanted to do if she was almost, she's almost nine months pregnant? What should Mary have wanted to do naturally? Where she want to do? She would have stayed in Nazareth. She would have stayed in her little house in Nazareth, and then Jesus would have been born where? Could that take place? Why not? Because the great clock of time prophecy said that Jesus had to be born in the fullness of time. He had to be born on time. He had to be born nearly 4,000-year 4, uh, generation. He would have to be born not in Nazareth, but in what? In Bethlehem. But do you know that naturally he would have been born in Galilee, but an event took place that made him be at the right place at the right time. Does anybody know what the event was? Look at, look at verse 1. Look at verse 1. Luke 2 verse 1 says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree. A what? Now what is a decree? Talk to me. What is a decree? A law. Now it says there went out a decree by what? By Caesar what? Augustus that all the world should be what? Tax. Now, my brothers and sisters, what, who was Caesar Augustus? Who was Caesar Augustus? What, what kingdom, what empire was Caesar Augustus over? Now, Rome was not one of the superpowers of that time. Rome was what? The world superpower. Who or what nation would be Rome today? America. Am I right? So what Rome was then, America is today. Now, at the first coming of Christ, what event showed them that they were only a few short months before the 4,000-year mark in the first coming of Christ? What event took place by the highest nation on earth? It passed a decree. Now, history is going to be repeated. Advent hath been, so shall it be. There's nothing new under the... So that means that the now the leading nation of the world, which is America, just before the 6,000-year period is reached, what will be passed on earth to show us that that 6,000 years almost reached? What will be passed? A what? Decree. Now watch this, brothers and sisters. And it says, make America what? You better watch this. Now listen. I'm, I, please listen to me. 
Do you know the last thing that Babylon, that, that Nebuchadnezzar said just before Babylon came crashing down? He said, is this not, is this not great Babylon that I have built? I'm going to show you something tomorrow. I'm going to show you. It's over. Now listen. Now watch this now. Great change that's going to take place in the final movements will be what? Rapid ones. Inspiration says, by the same works, by the decree, enforcing the institution of the what? Papacy and violation of the law of God, our nation, talking about America, will disconnect herself what? Fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of what? The Roman power. When she shall reach over the abyss to class hands with what? Spiritualism. When under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall do what? Repudiate how many? Every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make what? Provision. For the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the what? marvelous workings of Satan and that the end is I'm going to tell you something. That decree shows us that that 6,000 years is almost here, that we are in that final generation and the question is, is their sign showing us that that decree is about to take place right now, yes or no? Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring this message to a close, show us if ever there was a time to get ready, the time is now. Please help us, dear God. Show us, Lord, that we must go inside that most holy place with Jesus Christ. Please, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to go in your Bible, 1 Corinthians, as we get ready to close. Now, go in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 10. What book did I say? Now, when I say law pass on earth, something happens in heaven. Inspiration says, the gov it says, government to consider adding Sunday as a day of what? Now, brothers and sisters, this is Jew. This is Israel. They know the seventh day is the Sabbath. Now, do you know, this says, in 2011, the government was considering adding it as a day of rest, but do you know that in 2013, it says, Israel adopts a what? Now, if they passed a Sunday law to a measure, you know what America is getting ready to do right now. You don't have to ask yourself the question, but before the Day of Atonement, there's a reason, my brothers and sisters, when this Sunday law, you see it coming, why isn't Sunday special anymore? This says in Fox News, let's make Sunday a day of what? And do you understand, when Sunday law passes in America, it's going to be too late for Seventh-day Adventists to get ready. See, when Sunday law passes in America, judgment would have passed from the dead to the living. Now, the Bible says in Revelation 14, under the first angel's message, you know what it says, and I saw another angel do what? Fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach in them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue, and saying with a loud voice, fear God, and give what? For the hour uh, is, is, now do you know, my brother and sister, when the hour of judgment comes, it's too late to try to get sin out of our lives. When the hour of judgment has come, either we're ready or we are not. Now, look what this says. This Pittsburgh said, I'll come back to this. It's talking about right now, it said, our Congress should revisit, it says revisit adding Sunday. I'll show you this tomorrow. As a day of rest, talking about how this Sunday law is coming. It shows us, brothers and sisters, that when that Sunday law is passed, it's going to be too late for the people of God to get ready at that time. That Sunday law is when judgment starts, and judgment will start with the house of God's people. There's a reason for this. Now watch. That decree put Jesus at the right place at the right time. Now, we'll come back. I'll show you this. I'll make it more plain, plain what that's talking about. We'll show you that what it does, it shows that Jesus, in fact, let me give you that. No, 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 no. Let me give you the Heavenly Father. Lord, there's so much. But as we close tonight, show us, Lord, if ever there was a time to go into that most holy place, we have to go in right now. Please, dear God, in Jesus' name, amen. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. If ever there was a time to go into an all-night prayer meeting, it's now. Do you know that everything that God has said will take place is happening right before our eyes? We've lost a knowledge of ourselves. Do you know on the Day of Atonement, do you know that the reason why we have health reform in the church is because of the Day of Atonement? Do you know what happened on the Day of Atonement? 
When you study the Day of Atonement, you know the Bible actually says that they afflicted themselves on the Day of Atonement, that a special fast was called on the Day of Atonement. Do you know that all year long, they ate everything they wanted, but not on the Day of On the Day of Atonement, they had a special diet. On the Day of Atonement, they changed everything about them. Their diet changed. Why? Because it says, fear God and give what? Glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is... And then the Bible says, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the... So that means that our giving glory to God affects how we eat and what else? Our habits of eating and drinking will show my brothers and sisters whether we've really gone into that most holy place with Jesus. Our habits should reflect the fact that we want to give God glory. And do you know that there are things that you can eat in out of court that you cannot eat inside that most holy place? And this is why that on this day of atonement that God showed us all this that was taking place. When Jesus moved inside of this, that this is the reason why I'm coming, I'm a pass, now, I hate to pass this, but I'm at the passing. Now God has to get us sentenced by the passing of the Sunday law. We have to understand why. We've got to go inside that most holy place. There's a reason why God is trying to take us in there because there is something called the duty of the congregation on the day of atonement. Now watch this, brother and sister. I want you to see this. Watch this now. I'm going inside the most holy place. Inspiration says that by looking to the sanctuary, we can understand the what? Work of Jesus where? Why? Because thy way, O God, is in where? In the heavenly sanctuary. We can see that. It's clear. When you go inside that heavenly sanctuary, you will find out that there's something called the duty. The Bible says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole what? Now look what this says. Let's read this together. It is just as much what? Sin. To violate the laws of our being as to break one of the what? Inspiration says, I was again shown that the health reform is one branch of the great work, which is to fit a people for the coming of the Lord. It is as closely connected with the third angel's message as the hand is with the... Inspiration says, men and women cannot violate natural law by indulging depraved appetite and lustful passions and not violate the law of what? Therefore, God has permitted the light of what? Health reform to shine upon us that we may see our sin and violating the laws which has been established in our being. And in love and pity to the race, he causes the light to shine upon what? Now, do you know that, brothers and sisters, if we violate health laws, we are violating the Ten Commandments law, and we can never be ready for a judgment that, and by which we are judged by the law of liberty. This is a duty of the congregation on the day of atonement. God is trying to bring us inside of that most holy place for a very specific reason. Inspiration says, that now in the outer court, you can eat anything you want. You know you can have KFC in the outer court. You know that, don't you? You can eat flesh in the outer court. You can eat chicken in the outer court. You can eat any, anything that has a face you can't eat in that most holy place. But inspiration tells us, my brothers and sisters, it says, among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will what? Eventually be what? Flesh will cease to form a part of their what? Now, my brothers and sisters, you know why? Because of the day of atonement. On that day of atonement, God had to take possession of their hearts and the possession of their so that he could bring them back into a sinless condition by the power of the indwelling Christ. This is why God gave us this. It tells us that greater reforms should be seen among the people of God who claim to be looking for the soon appearing of what? Christ. I'm going to tell you something. Whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we've got to do it to the glory of God. But right now in the day, the devil says, let them play a little along with sin. And I'm going to tell you something. When, when, when Donald Trump came into office, what was one of the first things he did when he got into office? Anybody remember what was one of the first things he did? Anybody remember what he was? One of the first things he did was that he passed an immigration law. He passed a what? He passed an immigration law. Now, when he passed an immigration law, do you know that this itself was prophetic? You know, do you know what the newspaper said? The newspaper said that there was a religious test being offered. How, how many remember when they, when they talk about religious test? Anybody remember that? 
Then when you actually go through, it actually talked about the fact that there was some type of religious test that was being offered in before. That some type of religious test was being offered right before. Now I want to get to I'm, I'm closing. Heavenly Father, bless us, Lord. Bless us. Now watch, I'm, I'm closing. I want you to see this, though. I want you to see this as we close. We have spiritual amnesia. We, we, we see this. Here's the day of atonement. We see that. We see the signs. We see what's going on. We see this pope. We know what he's doing when he's coming on the scene. We know why it's happening now. We see that this handwriting is on the wall. We understand that there was a reason for this homosexual law. We see why the pope came to America. We see why the pope, pope, was, the pope was the first uh, pope to become the first pope to address what? Because if there's going to be a decree, where's the decree going to be passed? Where's the decree going to be passed? Watch this, brothers and sisters. There's a reason why it's happening now. Look what it says. Is uh, Obama, he's uh, not Obama, but uh, 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 Trump, uh, he says he's going to make America great again. Now, this is the reason. 2017, something's happening. This says Syria has denied that it possessed chemical weapons, and Russia held to its view that Mr. Assad, the president, of, uh, 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 the president of Syria, had not bombed his own people. The American attack left six people dead. It says here that this was an act of what? Now, I want you to say it with me. It was an act of what? It was an act of what? Flagging aggression. Now, watch what the prophet says. I want you to see what the prophet says concerning this very thing. Here's Donald Trump. His executive orders. Here's what he passed. Here's what he said. He says, in the executive order that is said was part of an extreme vetting plan to keep out radical, Mr. Trump established a religious what? Now, have we heard that before? Yes or no? Watch what the prophet says. Great controversy, 442. It says, the founders of the nation, America, wisely sought to guard against the employment of secular power on the part of the church with this inevitable result, intolerance, and what else? The Constitution, this is the Constitution, provides that Congress, quote, shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise, what? And that no, what? Very words, no religious test shall, what? ever be required as qualification to any office or public trust under the United States only in what? Only in what? Flagrant violation of these safeguards to the nation's liberty can any religious observance be enforced by civil authority. But the inconsistency of such action is no greater than is represented in the symbol. It is the beast with lamb-like horns, but look how inconsistent it seems that speaks as a what? So that means that when we see this aggressive spirit take in, we know that America is getting ready to speak as a, and pass a national what? Sunday law. And my brothers and sisters, now notice what this says. Republican Keith Ellison says, if they can ban Muslims, if they can ban, religious ban can ban Muslims, if they can ban Muslims, why can't they ban what? It is a religiously based ban which is something that our Constitution says Congress shall make no law establishing a religion. It says this is a violation of equal protection. It is a religiously based ban. If they can ban Muslims, why can't they ban Mormons? Why can't they ban what? Now, I'm going to tell you something. What you see happening toward Muslims is getting ready to be a, to directed towards seven-day Adventists. We're not ready for this. If ever there was a time to get ready, it is when? It's now. Do you know the inspiration says that one of the things that is going to have to change, our diets have to change. Our health has to change. Whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we have to do it to the glory of what? I don't know about you, but whatever it takes to be ready, I want to do it. Do you know the greatest change that must take place? The greatest change, though, is not dying. You know what the greatest change is? My heart. Tonight, I believe that if ever we are to rededicate ourselves to God, we should say, I want to stop playing church. I want to stop playing. Do you know that inside the most holy place, there's a diet of the most holy place? There's a dress of the most holy place. There's a worship of the most holy place. There's a life of of the most holy place. And it's time to have that life with Jesus. What do you say? Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, a crisis has developed all around us. The handwriting is on the wall. The signs are clear. But Lord, we don't understand. Father, if we really understood the time in which we live, we would want to stay all night praying that Jesus will get our hearts ready for what's coming. We would not want to hold on to any idol. We would want our hearts to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And so, Father, I pause this prayer. There's someone here tonight that says, Lord, I see the handwriting, but I know that without Jesus, we can do nothing. Nothing without Jesus. And you want the help of Jesus tonight to get you ready, to get your family ready, to help others to get ready. I want you just to raise your hand wherever you are. You're saying, dear God, I need the help of Jesus. Father, you see every lifted hand. And if there's any hand, Lord, that has not been lifted in submission to Jesus, I pray that you won't let us sleep tonight, that you will agitate us, that you will stir us. For your desire is that not one soul will be lost. And if we come to Jesus in that most holy place, there's still hope tonight if we run to Jesus. And so, Father, we lift our hands asking that you'll grab hold of them and take us into the most holy place with Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation.